Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Forbes senior contributor, Dr. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for joining me. Always uh, good to talk with you, Brittany. It's always bittersweet having you because I love having you as a guest, but usually when you're on, that means a huge storm is headed somewhere, and that is the case now. Hurricane Lee has been making headlines over the past 24 hours at least, and you're writing for Forbes that this storm in particular is stunning meteorologists. What can you tell us? Well, it's certainly stunning me, and I've been at this for a while in the field of meteorology. Just storms today, Brittany, particularly hurricanes, are doing things that we just haven't really seen very much of. And Hurricane Lee certainly falls into that category. It has a fairly common name, but it's a very uncommon storm. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in the last 24 hours is that this storm has rapidly intensified. Uh, it really jumped from essentially an innocuous tropical storm or low-level hurricane to a Category 5 hurricane. Now, let me define for the viewers and listeners what rapid intensification means. That means that a hurricane's wind speed increases by at least 35 miles per hour in a day. I'm about to drop something on you that is stunning. Hurricane Lee's winds increased 80 mile hour in a day. And we've only seen that six other times in the recorded history, and those have all been in the last 20 years or so. And so something ominous is going on, but we've got to keep an eye on this storm because we don't see too many Category 5 hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin. When you and I talk, you caution our viewers a lot. Don't worry so much about the category. Don't get hung up on the category. But the way you said category five has me hung up a little bit on the category here. Can you describe what cat five is and if you're nervous? You know, a cat five storm winds are well over 155, 156 miles per hour. And, and you're right. That, that's a, a lesson that I hope anyone that has listened to us over the years uh, takes away. It's the impact that matters more than category. However, when we have a category five storm, those are the types of storms that when they do make landfall, uh, they have catastrophic destruction. I mean, Hurricane Michaels of the world, for example, and so forth, just catastrophic damage. Now, the good news right now, as of Friday morning, when you and I are speaking, is that the best forecast models do keep Lee out to sea, it kind of curves it back out to the North Atlantic. However, uh, some models have been trending towards a little more of a westward nudge, which would bring it a little closer to the eastern U.S. or Canadian coast. So if I'm anywhere along the northern east coast of the U.S. and Canada, places like Cape Cod or up in Newfoundland, I would be watching this because we're still about a week away from any sort of close landfall encounters. But again, I want to emphasize right now, uh, the storm is not forecast to make landfall in the eastern U.S., but we are watching the trends in the models because, because when you have a storm this strong with that much warm water in front of it, uh, it's important to keep an eye on it. And one of the other things that surprised me or stunned me as a meteorologist is the National Hurricane Center was very aggressive, Brittany, about forecasting rapid intensification days ago. They saw that this storm was moving into an environment that was conducive for explosive development. And that's just something that I, in my career of over 25 years, haven't seen that. The word explosive when you're talking about a storm obviously is never good. And I want to talk about these rapidly intensifying winds here. How was it able to gain strength so quickly? Because the numbers you're describing, you're saying this has only happened a handful of times within the past 20 years. How only a handful of times really over the last 150 years and most of them have been in the last 20 years so it's a very rare event but the point i made about the last 20 years suggests that something different's going on and we know that that's the warming climate system the warming sea surface temperatures and ocean waters uh, as i often say hurricanes are big heat engines and warm water is their fuel uh, they're running on 93 octane fuel not 87 octane fuel these days and so uh, that's how this storm was able to really intensify so rapidly it had a lot of rich warm water to, to feed on and it wasn't really moving into an environment of, of strong wind shear that would tear the storm apart. 
Now, interestingly enough, Brittany, we're in an El Nino right now. Typically during El Nino years, uh, we see less frequent hurricane activity in the Atlantic. But because ocean temperatures are so warm, that is overcoming the typical lack of hurricane activity that we tend to see during El Nino. So in other words, the ocean temperatures are so hot, if a hurricane tries to form, it has plenty of fuel supply, irrespective of the big picture things that are going on around it. Are you expecting more of these types of storms to occur in the near future? So the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season, both the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and some of the best seasonal forecasters like the Colorado State Group predicted and updated their predictions just a few weeks ago that this season was going to be an active hurricane season above normal. Now here's the scary part. We aren't even to the statistical peak of the hurricane season yet. That tends to come in the second week of September. So we're on the front side of the mountain, if you will. We've still got the other backside. So we still have uh, another two months of potential hurricane activity. So I certainly believe we will see more storms over the course of this season. And then the scientific literature, and I've written about this previously in Forbes, suggests that though we might not see more hurricanes as climate changes, when they do form, they will likely be on average stronger. I do want to talk about the five things we need to know during the halftime of Hurricane 2023 season, which we'll get to in a second. But I do just want to finish talking about Hurricane Lee. And you mentioned that the most accurate path as, as of now, it isn't making landfall in the U.S. So sh what should we be thinking now? What should we be doing? How should we prepare? What are some tips here? Well, if I'm living anywhere on the East Coast, irrespective of whether it makes landfall, the storm's so big, it's going to produce large swells, perhaps rip currents on coastal communities, even though the storm is well out to sea. So um, be cognizant, cognizant of that. But even if you live anywhere, say, from the mid-Atlantic up to the Northeast into Canada, just continue to watch the evolving forecast. Uh, oftentimes, people will do something called anchoring. What is anchoring? They will look at a forecast that they see today and assume that's what it's going to be five, seven days from now. And sometimes these forecasts evolve. So it's important to watch the evolving forecast because some of these models are starting to slightly nudge it a bit further to the west, which could bring a landfall into play for upper Canada or parts of upper US. And again, that's not the likely scenario as of Friday morning, but let's keep watching it. So just keep paying attention if you live anywhere in the Northeast. I've been um, guilty of anchoring and then I don't bring an umbrella and get soaked. But do you, th so you're saying that this forecast really does have the potential to change and could it change swiftly? Yeah, I don't think it, I, I think there, it'll be a gradual change, but it'll, if it does change, it'll, there will have enough lead up time for people to adjust. That's why I say monitor the National Hurricane Center, your, your best weather sources now. Uh, uh, but again, the best models in the world that we use, the European model, the American GFS, bring the storm west, northwest towards the U.S., but then it curves back out into the North Atlantic. Now, the, how close that curve gets to the coast, that's what we'll be watching for. Before we talk about hurricane season as a whole, is there anything about Hurricane Lee specifically you want to touch on? Anything else that's stunning or surprising you? No, I think the rapid intensification, just how strong it is and how how aggressive the the National Hurricane Center forecasters have been in, in this forecasting, this aggressive intensification, that's just something that speaks to, on the one hand, the fact that our forecasting capability is continuing to improve, but on the other hand, they're gaining, unfortunately, too much experience with these rapidly intensifying hurricanes in the last five to 10 years. Let's look in the future the next few months, perhaps. You write for Forbes five things to know as halftime of the 2023 hurricane season approaches. And you first write that the basin is very active right now. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, as we've seen with Hurricane Lee and others, we've seen out in the Atlantic Basin several storms in various phases. We saw a couple of storms that were sort of at the end of their life cycle and then uh, we've seen, for example, Lee spin up and there are a few other sort of clusters of storms that are coming off of the African subcontinent uh, in the 
eastern Atlantic that could develop and, and into named storms. So it's not surprising we are in the most active part of the hurricane season, again, late August into early September. So uh, it's just an active part of typical hurricane season, and we're sitting right, right smack dab in the middle of it. And you're saying the peak of the season is still days away. Remind us when that is again, and what should people be doing to prepare? Well, it's, you know, around September 10th, 14-ish in that time frame, is that's when we see, if we look at the last several decades on average, the peak activity in the Atlantic Basin. And just because we peak at the sort of second week of September, what that means is we still have all of September and most of October to go in, in, in terms of getting storms. And with the waters as warm as they are, that means that people shouldn't let their guards down. They should continue, continue to monitor these storms, continue to monitor um, uh, situations if you live anywhere on the coastal U.S. Because again, as we get to the latter part of the hurricane season, uh, we start to see a little bit more activity in the Western Caribbean and perhaps in the Gulf of Mexico as well. Right now in August and early September, the storms tend to come from what we call the main development region or MDR. That's the region just off the coast of Africa and the Eastern Atlantic. And so that, that part of the region is quite active right now. And are you attributing those warmer ocean temperatures to the reason why activity is expected to be above normal? I, I, it is. I, I think the waters are so warm. Uh, again, even in, in a typical El Nino year, we have some suppression of activity because of jet stream patterns and wind shear. But the waters are so warm and we're getting a lot of storm clusters coming off of the African subcontinent or in the Atlantic uh, that they have plenty of fuel supply to tap into. We've talked time and time again about these warm waters, but you wrote for Forbes that recent storms caused cold wakes, but Atlantic water is still running hot. Are these cold wakes helpful at all in diluting these storms? They theoretically can be. I mean, when, when hurricanes like uh, Idalia that we saw recently make landfall in Florida moves up into the Carolinas and then out to sea, uh, storms like that can churn up the deep, colder water, and so future storms that move over them uh, can actually, in some cases, be suppressed. But I don't really foresee that being a big issue for the rest of the season because, again, the waters are running so hot that, that, that those temporary upwelling of cold waters that we see, those tend to only last, you know, they're temporary. So I think the ocean state is uh, will relax back to its warm state, and so... Uh, we'll have to keep watching over the next six weeks. Another thing you um, tell us to pay attention to is the messaging around hurricanes. And you wrote, be cautious of urban bias in hurricane communication. Can you elaborate on that for us? You know, this is something I'm very cognizant of when I write for Forbes. So, you know, one of the things that I kept hearing about when Idalia was making landfall in northern Florida, I, I, and people didn't mean anything by it. They didn't mean any harm. It's just was sort of the inertia of what they were saying. It was like, thank, thankful that it's making landfall there because there aren't that many people there. And what they certainly are trying to say is that there are less people than, say, a big city like Houston or New Orleans or Miami, and so there will be likely less potential for damage or loss of life. However, it can have the, the misintention of suggesting that those lives in those more rural or less populated areas are less valuable, and that's not the case at all. So I just kind of urge people to kind of be cognizant of that when they're, you're doing risk communication, because it's absolutely a fact that uh, there would be more impact of a major hurricane in a larger city. Uh, but I think we need to find a way to sort of say both, that that's the case, but also we value those lives in those smaller rural communities as well. And so that's that's really all I meant by that. And and also, you know, there were cities like Perry, Florida, Madison, Florida, Valdosta, Georgia, smaller cities that took a beating from Hurricane Idalia. They just, they're, they're going to be recovering for weeks to months in advance. You know, it's important that we give give those recovery efforts attention as well, because I imagine if it had been a big, big city like New Orleans or Houston, we'd still be talking about Idalia right now. I'm sure. And how would you suggest people shift their language here? Because I'm sure the intent isn't to minimize the devastation or anything about the lives lost there, but the impact doesn't match. Yeah, I think it's important that we just say both. We say that, you know, that because it's not impacting lar a larger populated area, 
there's likely to be less aggregate damage or loss of life. However, in the places that it is going to be impacting, uh, there's potential for life altering, life changing consequences. And so I think it's just important that we say both. Dr. Shepard, per usual, I really appreciate your insights. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Brittany.